scripture lesson, our gospel lesson this morning, comes from the gospel of Matthew, and I'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 12th verse, hear the word of God. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. I believe it is always a bit tricky to use a sports illustration in a sermon. Because I am fully aware that we have some people who are very engaged in sports. They follow sports very closely. But we also have people who don't care for all the emphasis in our society on sports. They even hold sports in somewhat of disdain. Actually, I believe that people maybe fall in one of three camps when it comes to their attitudes about all that is around us with sports in our day. You do have that group that is very engaged, maybe with their favorite teams, But also with sports in general, these are the people that, after the service, can tell you some NBA scores, can tell you some college basketball scores, talk about the Pro Bowl this afternoon, and who's doing well at the Australian Open. These people are engaged. Then you have the second group, the second camp. They're more social sports fans. They follow along just enough so that they can work it out in conversations. They're able to maintain themselves in a conversation talking about sports. And when it comes to the Super Bowl, they're there. They're at the Super Bowl party. By the way, if you're going to have a Super Bowl party next week, you can tell the difference between the really engaged camp and the social camp. Here's how you tell the difference. The really engaged people will come into your home, and the first thing they do is go immediately to see the size of your TV screen. (laughs) They want to know if they're going to have a really good view of the Super Bowl. The socially engaged people come in, and they want to go have a really good view of your food table, and they want to see how many dips you have and what kind of wings. You, You watch that. You watch that, and you can immediately tell the difference between those two groups. And then there's the third group. Again, these are those people who have this disdain for sports and how it's been blowing up and all the money and emphasis that we have on sports in our culture. I grew up in kind of an interesting home. My, my father actually moved between those three camps. I'm not sure why, But at certain times, he was very engaged, and then maybe for a few months, he'd be kind of in the middle, and and then maybe he'd spend a year disdaining anything to do with sports. 
So I have a good understanding of those three groups. I've seen them unfold right in front of me. And when he was in his disdaining phase, he had something he would often say about football. Now, I know he didn't think this up. I'm not sure of the original source. But what he would often say about football is, all that game is, is 22 individuals desperately in need of rest and 6,000 people desperately in need of exercise. 22 people playing the game on the field and thousands sitting, spectating, watching, yelling, telling the others what they think they should be doing. In what we read this morning, Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he comes into the presence of these fishermen. And in the presence of Jesus and in this call for these disciples to follow, they leave immediately and they go with Jesus. They immediately get into action. They show activity in their lives. They go on the playing field of discipleship. There was no hesitation. They were ready to move, and they were ready to be engaged and involved. We often hold up this section, these verses, as to what discipleship is to look like. But when we do that, it becomes rather difficult for us because we feel this is a standard, this is a standard of engagement that seems so hard to meet. I think sometimes when we talk about these verses, people begin to shut down because they feel that's not realistic for who they are and for their lives, that I drop everything and I instantly follow Jesus. I'm sure you've heard those verses, you've heard many sermons preached on those verses, but I want to go and look at the first part of this passage. We don't often talk about these prophetic words and how they are spoken in contrast to the disciples becoming active. And moving with Jesus. See, in the first part of the passage, what did it say? It said, Those that sit in darkness. Those that sit, twice, sit in the shadow of the darkness of death. See, in the first part of the passage, we have people sitting. In the second part of the passage, we have people moving in action. It it feels a little bit like people sitting as spectators on the sideline and those that are in action on the field of discipleship. A contrast has been set up. And when I think of that thought of sitting in the shadows, I, I just think of sitting in the fog. You know, I think many people, when it comes to discipleship, feel like they're, they're a bit in a fog. They're they're a bit in a malaise. And and the fog is created by disillusionment and maybe disappointment and discontentment. And and they're in this fog and and they have the sense that they are sitting on the sidelines of discipleship, but they feel stymied. They feel paralyzed, not, not sure what it is they're supposed to do. Here we are at the end of January, and can you relate to that just a bit, feeling in a little bit of a fog and a malaise? See, I'm sure most of us started the year with some goals. Maybe you didn't call them resolutions, but you had some goals for the new year, some things you wanted to get accomplished, some new directions you wanted to go, some new activities. You were going to get on the field in some areas, and and here we are. The end of January, it's just been one month, but you're, you're back on the sideline. You're, you're sitting, and it's a malaise. It's a, a fog. You feel like you're, you're in the shadows, so to speak. 
See, Jesus appears in the presence of these disciples. The light that has come into the world comes into the space where these disciples were. And when the light comes into their space, they, well, they see things differently. This illumination from the very real presence of the living God in their space caused them to want to respond in ways that they would have never dreamt of just a few days or, or weeks before. Um, it feels like in the moment discipleship, but you know what in the moment discipleship is about? It's about moment by moment placing yourself in the presence of the living God, placing yourself with Christ placing yourself with Christ. So often we think about a to-do list of what we must be doing as a disciple and that overwhelms us and we fall back into the malaise sitting on the sidelines once again, sitting in the darkness. But when we seek, first of all, moment by moment, to be in the presence of the living God, to be in the presence of the light that has come, all of a sudden we have this illumination. We We start to see things differently. We begin to see avenues that we didn't know were there before. We begin to reach out and do things we would have never dreamt that we would have done. We leave behind things that we would never thought we could part with. In the moment, discipleship, moment by moment, seeking to be in the light of Christ. Because when you place yourself there, the, the fog lifts, the malaise clears, the disillusionment and discontentment and disappointment leaves, and new avenues of discipleship become obvious for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.